The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this eighth webinar on the secret teachings of all ages by Manley P. Hall. This and all subsequent webinars will be available on Makara.us under its own subheading as shown here. We finished last month knee deep in all things Druid, including their gods, both indigenous and Roman, their spiritual practices, the three divisions of uh, Druid, Ovate, Bard, and Druid, and speculative analysis on some of the Druidic objects found, like the Iodan Moran, pictured around the neck of the high druid. In fact, we had quite an animated conversation about this uh, item. So with that, let's pick up where we left off last month. And can we get a reader for this paragraph, this next paragraph? I am reading. Okay. Before a candidate was entrusted with the secret doctrines of the druids, he was bound by a vow of secrecy. These doctrines were imparted only in the depths of forests and in the darkness of caves. In these places, far from the haunts of men, the neophyte was instructed concerning the creation of the universe, the personalities of the gods, the laws of nature, the secrets of occult medicine, the mysteries of the celestial bodies, and the rudiments of magic and sorcery. The Druins had a great number of feast days. The new and full moon and the sixth day of the moon were sacred periods. It is believed that initiations took place only at the two solstices and the two equinoxes. At dawn of the 25th day of December, the birth of the sun god was celebrated. Thanks, Michael. So any thoughts or questions about this paragraph? Let's take a look at a neophyte druid's program of studies. First, druid cosmogony. Can we get a reader for this, please? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read this one. The doctrine of the harmony of the spheres, as held by Pythagoras, was, was also held also by the Druids of Ireland. And it is remarkable that the word Pythagoras signifies literally in Welsh explication of the universe or cosmogony from the verb Pythagory to explain the system of the universe. The following is the account given by the Reverend Dr. Collier of the opinions of Pythagoras, whom he makes to say, God is neither the object of sense nor subject to passion, but invisible, only intelligible and supremely intelligent. In his body, he is like the light and in his soul, he resembles truth. He is the universal spirit that pervades and diffuse, diffuseth itself over all nature. All things receive their life from him. There is but one God who is not, as some are apt to imagine, seated above the world, beyond the orb of the universe, but being himself all in all, he sees all the beings that fill his immensity, the only principle, the light of heaven, the father of all. He produces everything. He orders and disposes everything. He is the reason, the life, and the motion of all beings. Thanks, Biel. Of course, because the Druids wrote nothing down, the idea that they envisioned cosmogony as did Pythagoras is only an informed opinion, but it is an opinion held by many historians. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, the Pythagoreans um, 
doctrine made its way into um, ancient uh, Celtic uh, society. And then there's that Irish verb, Pythagory, which means to study cosmogony. Um, so here's some additional info on uh, Druidic cosmology. Can we get a reader for this, please? Yes, Karen, can you read that for us, please? Sure. The Druids taught the doctrine of one supreme being, a future state of rewards and punishments, the immortality of the soul, and a metapsychosis. It was a maxim with them that water was the first principle of all things and existed before the creation of unsullied purity, which seems a contradiction to their other doctrine that day, what, which seems a contradiction to their other doctrine that day was the offspring of night because night or chaos was in existence before day was created. They taught that time was only an intercept fragment of etern an intercepted fragment of eternity and that there was an endless succession of worlds. In fact, their doctrines were chiefly those of Pythagoras. They had great veneration for the numbers 3, 7, 19, the Metonic cycle, and 147, produced by multiplying the square of 7 by 3. Thanks, Karen. So uh, working from the bottom up, <clears throat> in the Metonic cycle, the phases of the moon happen on the same calendar day every 19 years, thus bringing together uh, lunar and solar cycles. I don't see the contradiction that Hecathorn sees vis-a-vis -vis water night and day. Um, Mulaprakriti, the one homogeneous substance from which all existence is formed, is often referred to as the waters of space in HPB theosophy. In contradistinction to fire, the spirit aspect, this undifferentiated substance exists in the night of time before the first differentiation, which is a cosmic solar god who ushers in the first day, quote unquote, a day born of night. So the Druids had it right. Um, maybe Hecathorn just didn't have the um, esoteric cosmology to understand. Um, and I say the Druids had it right, but again, you know, this is conditional because um, there's, there is evidence that Pythagorean uh, doctrine made its way into the Celtic uh, society, but not proof. Okay. The name of their solar deity, Bellinus, has significant numerology, as do the names of other ancient solar deities. Could we get a reader for this short paragraph? And Veronica, can you uh, read that for us yourself muted? You're can still, you hear me? yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Certainly it is that the mystical names of the sun, Abrex, Belenus, and Erechoel, the, der the, der the derivation of which have so puzzled etymologists, are no more than word forms of numerals making up the number of days in a year. Thank you. Also, Celtish, uh, Celtic slash Druidic esoteric designs depicting, for example, uh, before I go on, everybody get the concept here that these, that these don't come from an etymolo etymological, um, uh, let's say, uh, they're not derived from past usage of words that they were conceived so that their um so that their uh components their letters added up to the solar cycle of 365 uh so that's what's that's what's being said here and that's not only true of of the druidic bellinus but also of of abraxas which was um 
extant around the Mediterranean. So that's the point there. Uh, okay, where was I here? Um, also Celtic slash Druidic esoteric designs depicting, for example, the unifying principle demonstrating through three, four, and five-fold figures as shown here, suggest a deeply esoteric philosophy. Since the Druidic mystery school left no written records, these figures probably give us the most in-depth look into their philosophy available, if you accept that they do come from the Druids, which is quite possible. For this reason, I want to take a few moments to analyze a couple of these figures. Um, if you don't like sacred geometry, good time for a cup of coffee. Um, in the upper left, we have three interconnected half circles forming a triune figure interpenetrated by a circle. Everybody see this? Three interconnected half circles forming a triune or triple figure, which is interpenetrated by a circle. A half circle tacitly indicates the circle's diameter, thus suggesting the feminine second logos, the noumenon of matter. This gives, gives us our primary duality, Purusha and Prakriti, spirit symbolized by the circle and matter symbolized by that circle's diameter. The, re the relation between these two is an irrational, actually I prefer the term super rational number called pi, which holds within it the activating principle of manifestation to wit, stanza five verse six of the secret doctrine tells us, the Lapika circumscribed the triangle, the first one, the cube, the second one, and the pentacle within the A. Sounds like gibberish until we translate the text into numbers which gives us 3.1415, which is of course pi, the relationship of the diameter to its encompassing circle, representing in th represented in this verse by the term egg, from which all manifest. Using half circles, which demonstrate pi to imply a triangle does two things. First, it links the second aspect of deity to the third, providing a transition from the numeral diameter to the actively creative triangle. And second, the circular quality of these half circles suggests that this trinity is of the same nature as the circular unity from which it emerges. It's not something you'll get with just a, a regular triangle. This trinity is brought into being by pi the super rational function of the diameter. Thus, and get ready for a very uh, profound formula, one plus two equals three. One, the circle, plus two, the influence of the diameter functioning as the super rational pi equals three, the trinity in manifestation. Mathematically simple, but philosophically profound macrocosmically, and this is a critical tenet in the subject of the uh, first three stanzas of the secret doctrine, the connection between circle and triangle is only implied as illustrated by this figure. For the unmanifest remains forever untouched and unchanged by the reflection that periodically arises from it. Everybody see that, that the circle, even though it interpenetrates the triangle, it doesn't directly connect to it, as, do the tri as does the triune figure. It follows then that this figure contrasts two types of motion, the circular motion of pure being, a motion which is life itself, and the continuously changing but ultimately cyclic motion that characterizes the quote threefold one, universal mind in Munvantaric expression. In musical terms, the circle represents the note or sound of life itself, 
whereas the triangle represents the root, third, and fifth of the manifest chord of creation, which reflects into outer existence, the silence because unmanifest, yet all pervasive sound. Silent sound. We've heard that as the voice of the silence. Microcosmically, this figure gives us an implied up-pointing triangle, which could be seen as representing the spiritual triad interpenetrated by the circular monad. Notice that this triad of half circles creates a second down-pointing triangle at the very center of the figure, which could be seen as representing the soul. As we know, both the spiritual triad and the soul are downward extensions. The triad is an expression of the monad whose circle interpenetrates its three aspects. And the soul, whose parameters are, as here illustrated, are literally formed from the three aspects of the spiritual triad, is a downward or outward extension of that triad. So for us aspiring types, this figure could be used as a mandala representing our soul and monad, our higher aspects, and illustrating the energies that connect and unify them. One last thought. This figure could also be seen as representing a kind of outward to inward instead of top to bottom tetractus, as well as the tree of life. In the latter instance, the higher trinity of Kether, Chokma, and Bina, represented by Roman numerals, contain within their expression, instead of being arrayed beneath them, all of manifestation. So on the right, the, the typical tree of life uh, is a top to bottom system, right? Where manifestation is seen as a downward pointing uh, quality. Whereas the figure on the left, this triune figure, has the quality of manifestation, the one through seven, within the circle of its influence. It's a, it's a very different uh, quality. It's like being embraced by um, svabhavar or, or spirit matter instead of having it distanced and, and put beneath, right? Uh, let's see. Francis? So, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say, um, Anne Veronica uh, says that in Greek, each word can be associated with a number. She says she doesn't know much about it, uh, but that words that have the same number are connected between them. Oh, yes. Energetically. Yeah, you have a real key there. Um, and, you know, this I think is also true in Hebrew that there's, in fact, I know it is. Um, uh, Paul Foster Case in his book, The Tarot, makes, uh, suggests the, that the numerical value of the Hebrew letters is very significant and it's definitely connected to the higher arcana um, or the upper arcana. And I'm sure the same is true in the Greek. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. So, in conclusion, not only do we have illustrated in this figure the one that's the circle, the two, the diameter, and the three, the triune figure, but also the three and the seven, giving us the 10 of manifestation. There's more here, but I'd like to open it up to your thoughts or questions before we go on. Anybody have any, any thoughts about this? Usually this group is, is very much stimulated by imagery. Okay, well, let's hear if, uh, if and uh, when uh, you, uh, go you didn't give him enough time. I didn't. You're right. Go ahead, Martha. <laughs> oh, Francis, this is so exciting. Uh, if I can speak for your participants, we're just uh, steeped in many, many, many different thoughts. My... Um, I, this is a basic question. In the ordinary numerology, where numerologists tell us our names and our numbers and all that sort of thing, 
is it in any way related to what this, uh, what we're learning uh, here in terms of Blavatsky's uh, grasp of deep, deep, deep tradition going back to the Druids? Are they connected or is it just a kind of hard game? No, I think they're connected, short answer. Um, you know, I think I would have been much more interested in math back in the day, you know, like I'm talking about third grade, um, when I yeah. started gl glazing over, you know, uh, yeah. because mainly not because of any intellectual capacity, be that as it may, but just, you know, I, I couldn't get past the so what quality. Uh, yes. But when you, when you link subjective content to number, it opens up a, a completely new field of understanding. And of course, DK is just, his his teachings are full of numerical uh, significance, right? I mean, uh, the three as the, the three principles, the seven rays, they all have very specific meaning. And, and, and more importantly, in a way, is that there's a cross references between all these systems who that carry the same numbers. So, um, you know, the fourth ray and the fourth uh, kingdom, for instance, are deeply bound um, uh, as, you know, so that's the, you start with that premise and then you, you work inside this, um, the mystery of numbers to determine specific meaning, which is what I've done here, right? Um, and that's what, significantly the uh, such systems as the Tetractus, which according to the Pythagoreans can, was the key to all existence. You know, that was it. You know, that's all you needed. That was the book, right? Um, and the, um, the Kabbalah, uh, the, at least the esoteric Kabbalah, has much the same idea about the tree of life and the systems are deeply related, right? So, um, yeah. Um, and the numerology of your name is very significant. You know, um, uh, I, you know, for instance, the two numbers that have, I've, for many, many years, I've had a deep resonance with, and there's, and I've had experiences that uh, tied me to these two numbers. I mean, some of them really almost freaky experiences. Um, and I'm not alone in this. I've talked to other people who've had this. And those two numbers for me are 17 and 51, which is three times 17, you know. Uh, and then, you know, many years later, I found out that my birth name uh, added up to 51, right? So it's just, it's, there's something in, in you know, imprinting and intrinsic about a name and, and certainly the numerology of that name. So you have to figure that out for yourself, you know, what that might be. But esoteric studies is the best tool to do that with, so. Thank you very much, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And Anything then we, else? Yes, we do. Good, good. Uh, Lynn says, or she observes, two, four, six areas are so much smaller in size compared with the hard one, three, five, seven. Does that have any symbolism? <laughs> okay. For First of all, a disclaimer. These are my. This is my numbering. Um, now, the Roman numerals I took from the way DK numbers uh, the cosmic, the triangles in the cosmic uh, physical plane charts. Right. He always starts with one at the top, two to the right, and then three to the left. Isn't that your memory, BL? How he yes. does it? Yes. Yes. Right. Right, so that's that's where I got with that. Then uh, the rest of it, in a sense, is up for grabs. I thought about putting one in the middle, but then that would mean that either seven or four would go uh, at the top, right under Roman numeral one, and that didn't seem right, you know. So I I just decided to go clockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven in the middle. There's nothing. <laughs> informed about that, uh, except for, you know, my choice. I could have, 
And the reason I did the clockwise is for the same reason that um, DK, uh, or because I should say, DK goes uh, where he places his one, two, and three. So I just chose that. Now there would be an argument for going the opposite direction. You know, um, uh, you know, you could go two could be where the six is, three where the five is, and and four at the bottom. Now there's another argument for four at the bottom, you you know, when you're talking about um, um, the uh, sequence of globes, uh, in which case you really would reverse the two and the six and the three and the five, you know, um, where four would then be at the bottom, the one physical globe, but five would then be on the right side, you know, so it, there is no right way, which you're, this is a, a matrix, this triune with this circle, you know, that has many applications that what that's what makes it profound. So if you were going to use it as a descriptor, for instance, of uh, globes and rounds and chains, well, what I do is reverse the two and the six and the three and the five, you know, I'm, I probably would do that if I'd have thought of it. Right. So it's not, um, it's not um, carved in stone, um, you know, exactly where those are. However, if the two and the six and the three and the five were reversed, it wouldn't change what you just said, that the two, four, and six would be the even numbers and the one, three, five, and seven, I mean the small areas, and the one, three, five, and seven, the larger areas, but I can't, um, I can't assign any particular significance to that. I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't see, for instance, that those are lesser cycles, um, you know, um, in any way. So I couldn't follow it up in that way. But this is how you play around with these things, right? You, you, it's, 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 it's in a way more important that you that you realize that this is a movable feast and that you can play with these. Um, maybe the most important thing I should start here is to recognize the, the deep import of a figure such as this. And it's, and it's terrific uh, possibilities for being a symbol, right? For profound, uh, profound ideas, you know, DK says, a symbol maps or is the form of uh, some profound idea, right? Um, and then whatever you say about this symbol, right, however you interpret it, uh, is going to be, a, you know, it's almost like idea, idol, and, and, and I mean, idea, ideal, and idol, right? It's, it's three aspects of the descent of the idea. So, um, but yeah, I, I really recommend that you, you know, you think about symbols. Let's go back to the, well, we're actually, when we go on, well, we can see the four symbols that, that I chose out of all the many Celtic symbols. Every one of these has uh, some profound implications. And I talk a little bit about this one on the lower left coming up. So, um, Anything else? Any, anybody have any ideas? Yes. Uh, Anne Veronica says the number pi, 3.1415, in Greek words, each word representing one number, we say infinity, that God geometrizes. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Now, where did the infinity come in there? You, are you saying that the word derived from 3.1415 Let me let her... Okay. Maybe maybe it was <laughs> yeah. infinitely. Maybe it was infinitely. Go ahead. You're self muted, Anne Veronica. Can you um, respond to Francis's question? My question really is. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hi, Veronica. Yeah. Hello? And my question. Hi. <laughs> we can hear you. Uh, well, in Greek words, we say "ai ophelos omega geometry." I means internally, internet, intern, um, forever, eternity. Okay. And it's three words. It's the number three. Or is one word. It's only one letter. 
yeah. theos means board. Uh, it's four letters. Uh, geometry, geometrizes means uh, uh, <laughs> that he geometrizes. And uh, each uh, word uh, has uh, three, one, four, one, five letters. Oh, wow. Okay, that's so you literally could, uh, though not directly, but you could translate uh, pi into God geom geometrizes. Is that Forever. what you're saying? Forever, okay, <laughs> or continuously. Yes, in eternity. Or at least for yes. a month entire. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't, I didn't yes. know that. Thank you for that, uh, Aunt Veronica. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, go on, please, and Veronica, and add what you also typed in below that about the circle. Uh, I was looking at this uh, symbol. What's its name? Because my internet fell and I lost something. What What is this name of the symbol we're seeing here? Well, it, it doesn't. It's just a triune figure. It doesn't have a a particular name that I know of. It may. Uh, you know. As a I think it has a name. I'm not sure about. I can't remember it. Uh, as I was looking at it, uh, I was trying to see it three dimensionally, and I saw that the circle. It's as if it's keeping them, keeping them locked, uh, blocking them from uh, expanding three dimensionally. Oh yeah, that's I don't right. know if that if it it gives any meaning to what we're all talking about but it give me it, it's as if um uh, let me say that when you are in a manifestation all these come locked together uh -huh. yeah i would my interpretation of that would be that you have there's a kind of escher drawing quality to this in that the circle is uh, being pure spirit is inherently non-dimensional. Uh, and the uh, triune figure, the three half circles that form the triune figure are all about dimensionality. You know, they, they, uh, they express dimensionality. You could easily imagine them, you know, for instance, if you, twisted them that they could easily express a three-dimensional i mean you can just see it and as you say this the circle inhibits that but i think instead of it seeing it as an inhibiting quality you see the two overlaid uh in the same reality you know that you have spirit and form always you know the first and the third aspect um can, and but the beauty of this figure is is the quality of pi that that half circle you know if you just had a triangle and a circle you know you could create this figure as a triangle and a circle but you wouldn't have that you could say connective tissue that is created by the half circle which in uh implies pi right so yes thank you that, that's very really nice thank you <laughs> yeah anyone else any comments about this that's all I see at the time. Okay, let's move on to this. Let's see where I am in my notes. Um, okay, the bottom left figure. And here I'll be brief. Uh, depicts a kind of philosophical, not geometric squaring of the circle, which is just a way of describing the interpenetration of spirit and matter. It could be seen as the next involutional stage involutional stage of the figure that we just analyzed because its circle is really two half circles creating an invisible diameter from which merges the cross first indicating the third logos that's the symbol of third logos a cross and a circle also the symbol of the earth but it's it's um it's not an x as it is here um but then when extended beyond the circle the the uh, cross becomes the x of matter right notice that unlike in the left figure the line is continuous thus making this figure a candidate for representing svabhavat for those of you who have been following the secret doctrine 
which is manvantaric, spirit and matter as two aspects of the same being. So Vava unifies those two aspects, as does this figure. Um, given a choice between the two, I think the, the one on the left is much more profound. Um, every part of that figure uh, is relevant to its meaning whatever meaning you may derive from it. And it could be applied on many left different levels. Whereas on the one on the left, you almost feel like those little half circles that connect the, the um, X to the diameter. It's like, you know, if this is really a pure symbol, well, what are those? Why are they? Is it just to connect them? You know, it's those kind of questions you have to ask when evaluating the potency of a symbol. So, um, okay. Anyway, and that's one. Yeah. Sorry, we have uh, a comment from Karsten. He says by that numbering that you lose the balance in the tree of life. Three feminine, negative column two, masculine, uh -huh. positive. If you took one, three, six, seven in the center column. You know, I I think you've gone you're on to something there. Um, you know, you could you could certainly <laughs> I'm almost tempted to come out of full screen mode and just change it because you I think that is a strong enough argument that you could put three, six and seven. Uh yeah, I like that. I'm gonna do something I've never done, guys. Um yeah, I really do like that. See, I'm not stuck in my ways here. So that would mean, ah, oh, wait a minute though, guys. The the tree of life numbering is not, it's, it's not the real numbering. The real numbering, it starts at the top, one, two, and three, and then continues. Uh, four on the right, five would be where the one is. Uh, six down here, seven here, eight and nine. I believe that's the real numbering. And what I did here was just keep the odd numbers on the left because I think in fact, see, four, five, yes, six is in the middle on the real tree of life. Um, and you see that in, for instance, all the six cards of the, uh, here, I'm going to go back into full play mode here. Um, <clears throat> six is is in the uh, in the lesser arcana is always the most propitious of that suit, like the six of cups, etc. You know, it's a place of soul. Uh, so that's that's where the three is. The three would be where the Roman numeral three is. But I just was trying to illustrate a connection between the two. This is. In other words, completely unorthodox, unauthorized, um, and you know, if there were thought police, I might even be thrown in jail. Who knows? But anyway, so yeah, your point is well taken. Um, it does throw off that balance when looked at from that perspective, which is why it's a movable feast. You're you're in your thinking. Uh, I'm sorry, who was that? Carson was that? Who it was? Yes. Yeah. 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 In that thinking, you were using a different set of interpretive rules for this figure, which is absolutely appropriate. In fact, that's what makes it interesting. There isn't just one way to do this. Um, and that's not to make it all fuzzy logic. It's just to show the, mm, the numinal uh, quality of the matrix that is this figure. So, okay, now moving on. Uh, we'll okay, yeah. hold, hold, stop right there. <laughs> okay, and, and Veronica says the second symbol, it really looks like the spirit is crucified in matter. Mm, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, it's like pinned. There's that sense of being pinned by it, yeah. Um, 
actually the more I look at this figure, the less I like it as a pure figure. Going back up to these, how far do I have to go? Um, the other two, I think, have a pure connotation. For instance, the bottom right can be seen as a form of um, the, the foreness that takes us into the, uh, to the manifest world uh, creates a, a kind of swastika, um, which you can see there at the center if you were to, but this, interestingly, uh, you have both swastikas, you know, um, inherent in that, in the center there, one moving energy in one direction and one moving it in, in another, right? Uh, but there's no, let's see, unlike on the figure on the lower left, there's, there's nothing superfluous. And the upper right figure is, is a, a, a beautiful description to me of, of three and one, you know, seemingly, the seeming threeness absolutely universally connected with the unity, except for that you have, like you do in a triangle, three end points, right? Uh, you know, where those points terminate at the center of the spiral, right? But that spiral also insinuates a further furthering, a continuing of that spiral, that it continues inward, right? So, yeah, just also that figure has the uh, additional status of having been carved in the druidical subterranean grotto. Um, we either, we've either come to it or will come to it. I think we're still to come to it. You'll have a picture of that. Yeah, well, you were going to say something, Bill. Yep, yep, sorry. Um, Joe says the bottom left can also be seen as above, so below. Uh, could you describe more why that would be true? Joe, go ahead. I mean, I, see I don't have the best audio environment. Uh, if you look at it, it's just a re it's it's like a reflection, yeah, the upper right. reflecting to the lower. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, um, yeah, and you you have that on both the bottom figures, uh, but not on the two top figures. So yeah, and you have that. I think it's accentuated on the one on the lower left because of the the fact that the break in the circle suggesting a reflection you know certainly of the of the circle right um yeah that's interesting i guess my problem lies with those those little connecting lines they seem not inherent but added in order to create a continuous flow but you know if if you all can come up with you know a philosophical purpose for those uh, connecting lines, I'd love to hear it. Remember that it's the process of evaluation that's just as important as any conclusions you might come up with. Because you can bet that if Dual Cool was here, he would come up with um, different conclusions or at least expanded. I think it's reminiscent of, um, you know, in the blue books, the triangles, the two triangles that are connected by the, the uh, horizontal bar and how the arrows flow through that. It's the same uh -huh. feel I get with this figure, uh -huh. with that those interconnecting lines. Yeah, I like that. Um, I like that, Joe, because you, it, in other words, they're dotted lines. <laughs> they're saying- Exactly. Is, yeah, rather than being primarily part of the figure, they're, they're that which energetically connects the two, you know? course you know they've they made a real point of having the two on the right go under the x and the two you know and the under over is reversed from left to right is what i'm trying to say you know uh and that's the thing we even talk about you know um what's the meaning of the under over and we're not going to get into it because we have we have this webinar we have to do but um you know uh if you like this stuff folks um, I recommend uh,
take a look at my 25 webinars on sacred geometry, which um, it's kind of like an uber Sesame Street. We count from one to 12, oh, but it takes us 25 webinars to do it, right? So take a look if this is particularly exciting to you. We do some cool stuff in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think this is all enough to show that there's uh, the profound nature of these Celtic figures which since the Druidic order was the source of the philosophical and intellectual leaders of the Celts to whom these figures are attributed, it's at least possible that they are mute explications of Druidic philosophy. Of course, you know, we'll never be able to go any, go further than that, but it's, you know, certainly this figure on the left is a profound Celtic concept right whatever it was intended to mean by them we don't Fred, have specificity but we definitely have quality indicated yeah um jonathan says this the shape made in between or space in between are sets of three but the center is singular the top half reminds me of the hat or the cap that the pope wears and he says he's speaking of the first symbol yes of course you are yeah yeah interesting you know the mitre right which is a broken arc you know they somewhere around the 12th 11th 10th wait a minute in the 10th century the um all the cathedrals had a rounded arc top and then somewhere around the 12th century they they broke it they broke it like these um half circles are broken now that i've never looked into the specific nature of the geometry of do you know what i'm talking about they have it's called what's it called it's a certain um, martha i bet you remember there's it's there's a name of the arch that appears in the later cathedrals and it has this broken top quality like like uh, the figure on the left anyway uh, there may be some and that's the mitre always seemed to me that um, a reflection of that arch or that arc okay let's see um get past this let's get back to the text um as to the secrets of occult matter, we're just working our way through what what the uh, Druidic uh, curriculum was for becoming a Druid. Um, as to the secrets of occult medicine, mistletoe was not the only plant that was revered by the Druids. Can we get a reader for this? Lynn, can you read that for us, please? Yes. The Druids are said to have been much addicted to the study of the qualities of vegetables, plants, and herbs. <clears throat> Vervain was amongst their greatest favorites. They used it in casting lots and foretelling future events. They used it to anoint persons, to prevent fevers, etc. But it was to be gathered with certain ceremonies and at certain seasons of the year. The salago, a kind of hedge hyssop resembling the savine and the samales or marshwort, or the round leaf water pimpernel were also supposed to have supernatural powers to prevent evils and cure diseases and were gathered at particular times with great ceremonies. Thanks, Lynn. So the Druids were well acquainted with the magical as well as the medicinal properties of plants, but it was the anguinum or serpent's egg that was particularly prized, really prized above all else for its magical properties. Can we get a reader for this section? Scott, can you read that for us, please? Mm -hmm. The Druids venerated the serpent of Genesis, by whom they denied that sin was brought into the world, maintaining that it was a personification of the good principle, who instructed Eve in all the learning of the world, which has descended to us. The Anguinim, or serpent's egg, was a congeries of small snakes rolled together and encrusted with a shell, 
formed by the saliva and viscous gum, froth, or sweat of the mother serpent. The Druids say that this egg is tossed in the air by the hissing of its dame, and that before it falls again to the earth, it should be received in the sagas, lest it be defiled. The person who was to carry off the egg must make the best of his way on horseback, for the serpent pursues this ravisher of his young ones, even to the brink of the next river. They also pretend that this egg is to be taken off from its dame only at one particular time of the moon. For getting the better of their adversaries of any kind in any kind of dispute, in introducing them to the friendship of great men, they think nothing equal to the anguinium. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, this is this is quite a phenomenon, isn't it? Uh, you have to wonder how you know how much of this is pure fable. Uh, I love the little illustration there on the left. This guy catching an anguinium in the in his Sagums, said it, yeah, Sagus. Um, and then jumping on his horse and riding like crazy because these serpents, who I guess are as fast as horses, question mark, uh, are going to pursue him to the next river. It's very, it's just, I just love it, right? Uh, but there is historical evidence that um, there was a, a Roman who appeared in court uh in the court of caesar in britain with a with an anguinum and he was immediately condemned to death for possession of this anguinum so i don't know what that shows except for that there was just tremendous enmity enmity between uh the druids and their conquerors okay any questions about this Fascinating little tidbit. Druidic magic has been immortalized by the druid-like Merlin from the Once and Future King. But let's take a look at an account of Taliesin, an actual 6th century bardic magician. Can we get a reader for this? Martha, can you read that for us? You're self-muted. On arriving at the court of Maglin, Taliesin cast a spell upon the bards, so that on appearing before the king, instead of reciting verses in his praise, they could only pout out their lips, make mouths at him, and play blurm, blurm on their lips with their fingers. Maglin, imagining them to be drunk with many liquors, ordered one of his squires to give a blow to the chief of them named Hainan Vard. And the squire took a broom and struck him on the head so that he fell back in his seat. This seems to have broken the spell, for the chief bard thereupon explains to Maelgwyn that they were affected not by strong drink, but by the influence of a spirit sitting in the corner of the hall in the form of a child. Forthwith, the king commanded the squire to fetch him, and he went to the nook where Taliesin sat and brought him before the king, who asked him what he was and whence he came, and he answered the king in verse. And Taliesin are the bards and druids of Britain. Thanks, Martha. So, um, okay, we'll move on. This is all a lot of fun. And, and shows how many uh, stories uh, came up around the Druid culture, right? Taliesin always um, asserted that he was um, taught in the Druid school, even though he was a sixth century bard. Okay. Um, the single greatest surviving product from the silversmith's hammer emerging from Druidic times in Northern Europe is the Gundestrup cauldron. Of course, there's no accompanying commentary, but to my mind, the central figure in this panel from the cauldron looks like an entranced magician surrounded by the spirits of creatures from unseen realms. This is very shamanic rendering. 
the shaman's grip on and the proximity of the serpent to the shaman's ear suggests to me that he is receiving instruction, right? And we all know the, the wisdom of serpents, right? While his open mouth suggests the intoning of a magical chant that has drawn forth the spirits of the creatures surrounding him. In short, he is an intermediary or conduit between the serpent wisdom and his tribe. Could we get a reader for this? Not, this uh, quote is not directly related to the uh, cauldron, but it's, um, it's about magic. Hi, Yvonne, can you read that for us, please? Okay, the whole system is called Samhan Draoic, that is to say the magic of Samhan. Draoic signifies magic, Draoith, a magician. In the Irish glossaries, Sinoar, Sinor, which signifies an old magician, a sage, is always applied to the Druids. In the Gaelic translation of the Bible, the three magi who came to the birth of Christ are called Dryoats. Pliny, or Pliny said, Britain at this day celebrates the magic rites with so many similar ceremonies that you might suppose them to have been given to them by the Persians. Thank you. You're welcome. So here are two more panels from the cauldron. You know, the very fact that these panels are from a cauldron suggests that it was likely used for magical purposes. I mean, you're not going to cook your soup in a cauldron that's, you know, uh, uh, that looks like this. Here, the upper panel probably depicts the slaying of the white bull. Remember that? Uh, it's the culminating sacrifice that follows the annual ritual gathering of the mistletoe. That was the funnest piece for this webinar. In the march to battle of the lower panel, the dividing line between the upper and lower sections is a horizontal depiction of the tree of life. According to the Roman consul Cicero, the only druid ever known by name was a magician, as well as a, quote, master of the wisdom of nature. Could we get a reader for this? Catherine, can you read that for us, please? Sure. Okay. Caesar wasn't the only Roman leader to have firsthand experience with Druids in the decades after Posidonius. In a dialogue with his brother Quintus, the orator and consul Cicero speaks of a meeting he held with an important Druid. I know there are Druids in Gaul because I met one myself, Daviticus of the Adui tribe, who spoke well of you. He professed to be master of the wisdom of nature, which the Greeks call physiologia, the search for causes and phenomena, and partly by auguries and partly by conjectures predicted the future. Thank you. Provocative, isn't it? Of course, the etching is just an art, artist fancy from you know much, much later. But Davidiacus really existed. Initiations took place on solstices and equinoxes, we're told. Could we get a reader for this um, um, quote from Albert Pike? Antoinette, can you read that for us, please? Yes. The grand periods for initiation into the Druidal mysteries were quarterly, at the equinox and solstices. In the remote times when they originated, these were the times corresponding with the 13th of February, 1st of May, 19th of August and 1st of November. The time of annual celebration was May Eve and the ceremonial preparations commenced at midnight on the 29th of April. When the initiations were over on May Eve, fires were kindled and all the churns and the cromlechs in the island, which burned all night to introduce the sports of the May Day. 
The festival was in honor of the sun. The initiations were performed at midnight and there were three degrees. Taliesin, describing his initiation, says, the secrets were imparted to me by the old giantess. Mm. Keridwin. <laughs> Thank you, Keridwin, or Isis, without the use of audible language. And again, he says, I am a silent proficient. Yeah, I love this quote. Um, and for the first time, I'm noticing here uh, this uh, that the secrets were imported, imparted to uh, Taliesin by the old giantess. And of course, Theosophy holds uh, that it was a race of giants that built the great stone temples like, uh, uh, like Stonehenge and many others, Avabari, et cetera. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's a reference going all the way back to the sixth century. Um, and then this idea that Saradwin is Isis, uh, it just shows the, the, the tremendous influence that the Mediterranean uh, spiritual um, disciplines had on um, the Druids. Uh, but I love this, I am a silent proficient that uh, the old scientists um, imparted the secrets without the use of audible language, like a direct transmission, right? And thus, Taliesin became a silent proficient. It's quite, quite provocative. Okay, finally, let's see, yeah. The yearly ritual solstice feast held on December 25th originally was the birth of the sun god, which predates uh, Jesus. Can we get a reader for this, please? Diana, can you please read that for us? Yes, but I can see the slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. All right, well, then we'll get another reader. Okay, thank you. Francis, can you read that for us, please? Karen, can you? On the, on the 25th of December, at the first moment of the day throughout all the ancient world, the birthday of the god Sol was celebrated. This was the moment when after the winter solstice at the lowest point of his degradation below our hemisphere, Sol began to increase and gradually to ascend. At this moment, in all the ancient religions, his birth was kept from India to the Ultima Thule, a mysterious island north of Britain. These ceremonies partook of the same character. Everywhere the god was feigned to be born and his festival was celebrated with great rejoicings. The Druids called Sol Lord. This was enough for them. Everything which related to this Lord they seized on. Their monasteries, many of them built before the Christian era, had from time immemorial been dedicated to the god soul, and the rites of this lord became after long and bloody feuds between different Celtic tribes spliced into and amalgamated with Christianity. Thus was the 25th of December, the heathen festival of the god soul, selected as the birthday of Christ, and the Druidical festivals of the winter solstice became a Christian rite. Thanks, Karen. So uh, we have a little peek. It's not a sure thing, but we have a little peek into this idea of uh, the cosmic or at least systemic reason for uh, the 25th of December being chosen universally, right? Um, as this uh, birthday of the God's soul, right? He says here, uh, this was a moment when after the winter solstice, and the lowest point of his degradation below our hemisphere, northern hemisphere, 
soul began to increase. So, you know, we know that the, the actual solstice is on the 21st of December, uh, but there's this, it's like there's this gestation period here, this, these four days, um, and then and he emerges from this lowest point of degradation. It's interesting. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, uh, it's not mathematically correct. Uh, it, you know, he, immedi he immediately, in very small increments, begins, begins increasing. But I like this idea. It suggests some occult teaching here. Just points at it. It's the only thing I've ever seen, anyway. Okay. Um, any thoughts about this before we go on? Okay, back to the text. Next up, can we get a reader? Uh, yes. Lorraine, can you read that for us, please? Yes. The secret teachings of the Druids are said by some to be tinctured with Pythagorean philosophy. The Druids had a Madonna, or Virgin Mother, with a child in her arms, who was sacred to their mysteries. And their sun god was resurrected at the time of the year corresponding to that at which modern Christians celebrate Easter. Both the cross and the serpent were sacred to the Druids, who made the former by cutting off all the branches of an oak tree and fastening one of them to the main trunk in the form of the letter T. This oaken cross became symbolic of their superior deity. They also worshiped the sun, moon, and stars. The moon received their special veneration. Caesar stated that Mercury was one of the chief deities of the Gauls. The Druids are believed to have worshipped Mercury under the similitude of a stone cube. They also had great veneration for the nature spirits, fairies, gnomes, and undines, little creatures of the forests and rivers to whom many offerings were made. Thank you. So referencing Pythagoras, uh, Albert Pike tells us the secret Pythagorean doctrines of numbers were preserved by the monks of Tibet, by the hierophants of Egypt and Eleusis at Jerusalem, and in the circular chapters of the Druids. Interesting comment. As to the uh, Druidic Madonna, there was celebrated centuries before the Christian era in the district of Chartres, and very possibly on the very site of the great cathedral of Chartres, a festival in honor of the Druid Virgin, Virginie Pariture, depicted here on the left. An echo of this Druidic vir virgin can still be visited in the crypt beneath Chart, where sits Our Lady from Under the Earth. Also, according to Godfrey Higgins, in the year 1747, a Mithraic monument was found at Oxford. I searched, I could not find it, um, on which was exhibited a female nursing an infant. The goddess of the year nursing the god day. Can we get a reader for this uh, quote from Morals and Dogma? Michael, will you read that for us, please? The first druids were the true children of the Magi, and their initiation came from Egypt and Chaldea. That is to say, from the pure sources of the primitive Kabbalah. They adored the Trinity under the names of Isis or Hesus, the supreme harmony of Belen or Bel, which in Assyrian means Lord, a name corresponding to that of Adonai and of Kamul or Kamel, a name that in the Kabbalah personifies the divine justice. Below this triangle of light, they supposed a divine reflection, also composed of three personified rays. First, to Tates or Tooth, the same as the Thoth of the Egyptians, the word, or the intelligence formulated. Then Force and Beauty, whose names varied like their emblems. Finally, they completed the sacred septenary by a mysterious image that represented the progress of the dogma and its future realiza realizations. This was a young girl veiled, holding a child in her arms, and they dedicated this image to the virgin who will become a mother, Virginie Pariture. 
So Virginie Parks raised symbolic art at its best. Mother Wisdom, or Sophia, holding the, quote, progress of the dogma and its future realizations. The year, giving birth to the day, the greater cycle to the lesser, the latter always a symbol of manifestation. Of course, veneration of the cross predates Christianity and formed an especial significance among the Druids. It's often depicted in conjunction with the circle. We looked at this quote a couple of months ago, which describes the creation of a Tao cross using, a, <clears throat> using an oak tree and a cross member on which the names of Druidic deities were carved. Hesus, which is Isis, Teramis, Bellonis, and Tao. Hickens tells us this Tao was the symbol of the Druidical Jupiter. It consisted of a great oak deprived of all its branches, except only two large ones, which, though cut off and separated, were suspended from the top of its trunk like extended arms. By the way, um, Julius Caesar noted that even though Mercury was the dominant um, god in uh, Druidism, at least a dominant Roman god, um, I think makes it exoteric, he, he mentioned the importance of Jupiter to their teachings. This Tao cross survives in the form of the um, 12th major arcana of the Tarot, entitled The Hangman. Paul Foster Case says, the T-cross is a cross of living wood to symbolize the cosmic life and is shaped like the Hebrew letter Tav. And again, from Albert Pike, could we get a, a reader for this? And here, by the way, is where that triune figure that I showed earlier, see there on the left, is carved. Uh, yes, a reader, please. Barbara, can you read that for us, please? Okay, let's try. Uh, Catherine, can you read that? You're self-muted. I've unmuted you, but you're self-muted. Nope, that's not working either. Okay, let me just read it. Um, it is certain that the Indians, Egyptians, and Arabians paid veneration to the sign of the cross thousands of years before the coming of Christ. Everywhere it was a sacred symbol. The Hindus and the Celtic Druids built many of their temples in the form of a cross, as the ruins still remaining clearly show, and particularly the ancient Druidical temple at Classerness on the island of Lewis in Scotland. The circle is of 12 stones. On each of the sides, east, west, south, are three. In the center was the image of the deity, and on the north, an avenue of the twice 19 stones, and one at the entrance. The supernal pagoda at Benares is in the form of a cross, and the Druidical subterranean grotto at Newgrange in Ireland. That's what's depicted here. So um, I'm seeing that twice 19 stones, suggesting an awareness of, uh, of this cycle of where the solar and lunar um, cycles come together. You know, in other words, where the uh, phases of the moon land on the same days of the year. Uh, of course, it's, you know, it's never a sure thing. It's just the fact of 19 doesn't make that so. But um, since we have other evidence that there was veneration for the number 19, it suggests, suggests that. Any thoughts about this? Be a great place to visit, wouldn't it? We should do a, uh, we should do a, uh, an attendee outing. We could all meet here. Okay, serpents were associated with magical power. We know this. 
we read about the anguinum or serpent's egg, but there was also the myth, mythical pneumo, uh, which is more like the Egyptian Apophis. How can we get a reader for this? Sure. Lynn, can you read that for Prior, us? Yes, prior to Catholicism, the Irish practice a form of Celtic paganism similar to the Dugong religion. The serpent and fish-like alien Numo, who was, were most re often referred to as the serpent by the Dogon elder Octomali, appear all over Celtic Ireland. Okay, so you know, as it, as interesting as that piece of information is, um, uh, I would say as important as uh, as that is the fact that. Uh, it's a, it's another indication of how interpenetrated the the Britain and Ireland were with um, spiritual concepts arising from around the Mediterranean. I think it was a mix of indigenous, um, you know, remember the giant the giantess uh, that uh, initiated Taliesin. That's I think. Uh, indigenous to Britain, but then you have this pervasive other influence, you know, like the, the verb Pythagore, you know. Also, the serpentine design of certain temples, like the one at Avabari or Abari, suggests that the ancient giant ancestors of the Druids also venerated the serpent. Can we get a reader for this? Trudy, can you read that for us, please? An infinity of learning has been displayed by Dr. Stuckley to prove that the Druids worshipped serpents. And I should suppose that everything which any one of the ancients had ever said upon the subject of serpent wor worship may be found in his book upon Avery. I think the shape of that temple must satisfy anyone that they did pay it some kind of adoration. Dr. Borlase allowed that if the Druids had groves consecrated to Mithras, a god whose common symbol was a serpent, and temples in a serpentine form, they must have been worshippers of serpents. Thank you. Francis. Oh. Yeah, Michael. There's all this talk about serpents, and it just seems to me that uh, serpent is a symbol of wisdom. Always has been in ancient cultures. It's, you know, you could say it's also a, 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 the external symbol of the dragon, right? And, and right. that's where the connection comes, the dragon of wisdom. Yeah, good to and be here. Yeah, it just seems that... Um, there's so much lost uh, when when people forget the symbolism and look at the symbol as what is meant. Exactly. That, that they're worshiping snakes and not wisdom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you have, you know, exoteric uh, archaeologists, you get a lot of that kind of um, conclusions that are just you know, make you roll your eyes if you have any philosophical training at, at all, you know. As Joe Campbell said, famously said, when asked what was wrong with society today, he said, they've lost the metaphor. And there it is. Thanks, Michael. So, uh, Albert Pike. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and Veronica says, Isis is one of the names of the sign Virgo in the Zodiac. Yeah. Uh, Master DK says that Virgo is the most ancient sign. It comes to us through Eve, Isis, and Virgin Mary, each one a symbol of the mental, astral, and physical plane. She says BL can say it better than me. <laughs> but uh, she, said she, it, said it she said it very well there. That That yeah. is what DK tells us about it in Virgo. Um, yeah. And, and she right. says, of Mercury today, I was listening to Michael Robbins on a webinar on esoteric astrology. And he said that the rod of Mercury is an eight 
and that's the way the kundalini rises. Usually the eight is an unbroken symbol that has no beginning or end. Mm -hmm. Now as yeah. he talked, I had an image that three fires rise at the same time from the bottom up and then uh, form the eight. The cross symbol we were talking before reminded me of this, the Kundalini rising. Yeah, the only comment I'd make about that is that the solar symbol at the top, you know, the snakes seem to end at the head at the top, but then they're unified by that arc of this of this solar symbol at the top. You know, so you could also draw it that way, you know, and it becomes an eight. And of course, eight you know, is, um, we know it's a number of the Christ, um, and, uh, that, uh, Mercury as messenger of the gods. I mean, the very symbol of eight, uh, is, is, would be the symbol of as above, so below. Um, and it also shows the, the energy circulating between the upper and lower circles, right? Which is, you know, one of the fundamental concepts of Mercury. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And then Yvonne has her hand up. Go ahead, Yvonne. Uh, Francis, I have a question on that last slide. Okay. This one? Okay. And this, this is going to sound dumb, but is that, you know, it reminds me of, uh, and this is Celtic in Ireland, St. Patrick throwing the snakes out of Ireland. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. when, I look at, when I look at that, and that, you know, just doesn't make sense, because isn't he the one that's supposed to throw all the snakes out of Ireland? Uh, why doesn't it make sense? Well, because that's not what we're saying. If he threw all the snakes out of Ireland, they're, and they're sacred. Uh, I don't well, know. They, everybody, they, everybody got really dumb when they threw them out, right? No, there's... <laughs> There's two kinds of serpents, and this is true, um, you know, through all the esoteric teachings. There is a lower uh, dragon, or you could say the lower nexus, which you could call lower mind, really. Um, that is like a serpent, and it represents the form aspect, and more particularly the draw or the lure, allure, of the form aspect. And in Egypt, this is Apophis. I wish I could just pull up the slide because they have literally, you know, the, the, they show the Pharaoh very much, very much like this. They show the Pharaoh uh, with his crook, uh, very much like this crook, uh, um, uh, controlling this lower um, Apophis snake. And then there's the, the, the higher, uh, serpent wisdom, you know, uh, which is, you, you know, in, for instance, in Egypt, it's demonstrated by the Uraeus that always appears at, as the third eye on the Pharaoh, right? Um, and that's a, that's a different, that's a different serpent altogether. So you have, you have two things. And I think one distinction would be to see one as a dragon of wisdom. But, you know, we also have in Christianity, the lower dragon right which is really the same serpent that's the one that that george went after right and all of that is all of that stuff is metaphor for control of your own lower nature right that's what this is so when you drive all the serpents out of ireland well good luck with that if you can really pull that one off that would be great you know but i'm sure it has a some kind of um, esoteric connotation of, about Ireland as an entity itself. Uh, Francis? Yeah. I'm not sure how accurate this is or where I got it from, but um, I heard that um, St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland equated to him driving the Druids out. Well, that, yeah. Because they were... They the were snake. the represent yeah. exactly. Uh, I like I said, I don't know how, um, how true well, or not. It would be 
it's a kind of combination of exo and esoteric, isn't it? I mean, it's the literal driving out of a people, so that's exoteric. But the fact, and you know, the Druids were known um, among, you know, for instance, all the nations bordering uh, the Mediterranean, uh, they were known as magicians and as, um, you know, to be wise as serpents, right? That's a magical term. And that was just a uh, part of their uh, persona. So I'm sure that what you're saying is true, that it could have that. Um, and it could be that that's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah, that um, was... And, that was yeah. something I, um, okay, Scott's got his hand up, but I've got a couple of people here that uh, had comments before I get to him, okay? Um, Karsten says the eight in the tree of life is also Mercury, which also is the Archangel Michael, um, uh -huh. which can reach all planes. Okay. Do you mean by that the eighth Sephiroth, or that there's a figure eight that can be drawn in the tree of life. Yeah, the eight of road. Yeah, that, okay. That represent the uh, Mercury, or, or if you talk in angles, that's the Archangel Michael. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so that would be, if you can visualize the tree of life, folks, that would be the the, the bottom one on the right before the the two that are in the center that go on down ninth and tenth. I'm not going to pull up that slide. I'd have to go back too many, but uh, yeah, thanks for that. There's another affirmation of of Mercury being associated with eight. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, a whole bunch. Uh, Jonathan says, can we relate September as serpent member? In other words, are they related, the serpents in September? I think sept is is French for seven. Uh, septenary, for instance, is means sevenfold. So I think that's that's more the meaning, uh, you know, which is <clears throat> um, a puzzler since it's the ninth month, right? But maybe at one time it wasn't. Maybe at one time it was the the seventh. I know months were added later. There was 10 at one point. It, there was it, 10 signs at any rate. Okay, <clears throat> and, and then Carrie says, uh, the Dogon are a very advanced West African tribe. And the Boy, comparison that's... with the Celts is really interesting. It is, isn't it? And, you know, if you think about it, they were a Mediterranean dwelling tribe. They were in Northern Africa to the west of the Egyptians. I actually have a carved um, head mask that is from the Dogon. It's so beautiful and powerful. But um, a big part of their culture is, um, and this can be documented, that they recognize Sirius and Sirius B, right? It's a dual star. Way, way back, you know, way before there were telescopes, this was part of their culture. And so there was, you know, they had an informer, you know, there was some master who channeled that information to them. Also, there's a, there's a strong overlap between the esoteric Egyptian teachings and what you find translated in their own metaphorical language among the Dogons. So yes, thanks for that. It's quite true. Okay, one more and then, then I'll get to you, Scott, okay? Um, and Veronica says, I do not know if the ancients also lost uh, their symbology, but there was an ancient temple in Greece where they were giving healing through the snakes. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, there are to this day in the uh, among the indigenous tribes of the United States, uh, snake dances. I talked to a uh, a young man, I think he was 18, who was being initiated into that, uh, it was a Hopi tribe, that there was this cult of the snake dancers. And he was talking about that process. Much to my dismay, he had no business talking to me, but he was anyway. It's part of a 
uh, of a much longer, somewhat chilling story that I can't get into now. But <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh, snake uh, awareness of, of snakes being a symbol for wisdom is, um, you know, and I think that it's not just, well, let's make snakes wisdom. You know, it's not like, well, you know, why not cockroaches? No, let's make snakes. It's, you know, part of it uh, could be more direct than that. Uh, for instance, the snake venom can put you into an, it could also kill you, but it can put you into an altered state. Uh, and I'm sure that there, that that could have been part of it, though I think the true esoteric uh, foundation for it has to do with the Makara and uh, the constellation um, of Capricorn, you know, where the Kumaras come, which are called uh, dragons of wisdom. And I think that's going to be the higher source. Anyone else besides Scott? Uh, yeah, gonna... Scott's up next, and then Trudy's got her hand up as well. Okay. Yeah, Scott. Yo, hello. Hi. Um, you covered so much here, I don't even know where to start. Uh, going back to the Dogen, um, I think of them as being um, um, contemporaneous with the, the really, truly ancient Egyptians, or otherwise um, got their their um, their knowledge from the time when the Sahara was not a desert, and when the pyramids went right up against a forest that crossed North Africa. The connection with to into into with the Celts is really interesting. I've not seen that before, um, but why not? Yeah. Um, the depiction of the slide you have seems to me to be that as what Biel was saying is Saint Patrick, Saint and the, the Christian crook in his hand, the staff, uh, yeah. driving out the snakes, which esoterically, as you were suggesting, is the driving out of the druid um, snakes. The of wisdom with Venus and Mercury going with them ahead of them, indicating the sacredness of what's happening. This is Christianity uh, um, wow. because I've been told uh, that there were, there were never any snakes, real snakes right. in, in Ireland. Duh. Duh. So we're not talking literal here, folks. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. If you need an affirmation that this is, you know, esoteric, there it is. You know, there weren't any snakes to be driven out, right? Um, it's also interesting that myth, Mithras, which we'll be moving into next, though I, I can see that it's not going to happen today, uh, is a kind of combination of, well, let's put it this way, that uh, Mithras in its, um, and there were inroads all the way up into Ireland and Britain of the Mithraic um, religion, for lack of a better word, uh, and that there was a lot of inter uh, connection between the, the Celts and the and the Mithraic. They had a lot of the same beliefs, but anyway, that the feminine aspect of Mithras was Mitra, and that was Venus, and that mm -hmm. the masculine aspect was guess who, Mercury. Right? There's strong connection between. He carried a torch. Uh, well, we'll get to it. So that's that's just to say that, um, yeah, the the ancient way, you know, whether Mithras or Druids was being driven out by the the new quote enlightened unquote Christian faith. Yeah. Anything else, Scott? Uh, that's that's enough for right now. Yeah, you didn't want to make any comments about that triune figure, huh? <laughs> well, um, no, sure. not right off. Uh, there were there were things we could we could talk about, but I I passed on that. Uh, okay. I did I didn't go into all the, the the parts of it. it. Seemed to me that the arcs, uh, the fact that they that triune figure was one figure that that created that curved triangle, and then the other figure was the circle. Right. It's yeah. It's fundamentally two separate, two separate entities there in this, and following it around as a clockwise form and a counterclockwise form, 
um, was interesting too. Um, particularly the uh, the one you had was was split in the middle, uh, the circle that was split in the middle, going that one with the X, um, going one one was a clockwise form around half of it, and the other was counterclockwise. But these things can be um, looked at it for some time and played with different ways. But I like this. This one surely seems to me to be um, a Greek philosopher. That's the look of like a Plato up there. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, driving well. out the snakes and um, uh, not done by any druid, that's for sure. No, no, no. Being one yourself, you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, good, thanks. All right, and, and Trudy has her hand up too, so um, Trudy, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the Caduceus has two snakes, which is a healing symbol as two snakes rising up uh, by a staff. So it's it's not it's ah. it's not that the, the snakes are always seen as uh, negative. No, not at all. No, certainly not. Yeah, you know, that's a that's really interesting. We have a kind of uh, embedded caduceus here, don't we? Because there are two snakes there, you know? And then he's yeah. holding that staff. Uh, and then you have Mercury on the right, you know, giving us context. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, um, hmm. thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. Group work. Good. Okay. Anything else? That's it for right now. Did we read this? I can't remember. I can't remember which yes. side of we were on. We did read it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, Albert Pike tells us that all temples, did I read this? <laughs> no, I don't think I did. Okay. All temples were originally open at the top, having for roof the sky. Twelve pillars described the belts of the zodiac. Whatever the number of the pillars, they were mystical everywhere. At Avery, the Druidic temple reproduced all the cycles. Um, by its columns. Okay, worship, uh, we're making our way through this paragraph, slowly. The worship of sun, moon, and stars from the heart of this form, the heart of this druid prayer. Can we get a reader? Scott, can you read that for us, please? By the bright circle of the golden sun, by the bright courses of the errant moon, by the dread potency of every star in the mysterious zodiac's burning girth, by each and all of these supernal signs, do we adjure thee with this trusty blade to guide, guard yon central oak, whose holy stem involves the spirit of high Tyrannus, this be thy charge. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I find this just, I, well, it's quite a beautiful poem. Um, survived quite a bit better than, uh, you know, I am a druid, I am a scientist, I am a whatever. Yeah, this one really has uh, the potency of poetry. Okay, so on to the next paragraph then. We get a reader for this. Okay, just one second. We have, what could, and Veronica says, what could it mean that he keeps the staff and he expels the snakes? He keeps the staff? Yeah, in that picture. Um, right. He had the staff and was using it to expel the snakes was the implication. So, um, well, this, you know, this crooked staff is, has always been a symbol for leadership or, you know, because it's a shepherd's staff, right? So, for instance, the pharaohs are shown uh, with a, a, a staff or crook and a flail crossing, you know, which... Uh, on at least 
exoteric levels. Um, it's a kind of a combination of first and second ray is the way I've always seen it. You know, the flail is the discipline, um, the driving forth, you could say. And the crook is what a shepherd uses to, um, uh, to keep his uh, sheep in, you know, in line, in pasture. Um, so in, in this case, uh, it's, his, it's his signature of his own power. And you could say that if he didn't keep that staff, he wouldn't be able, the snakes wouldn't go anywhere. It's only by the, you know, have you ever heard by hook or crook, right? Um, so in this case, it's by, it's by crook. Uh, that is, it represents his potency. I, I got the sense that you were talking specifically about the caduceus. You know, why would he keep the caduceus and drive the snakes out? But I, I don't think the symbolism of the caduceus is the entire meaning of this freeze. You know, I think, um, who was it that first said uh, that, you know, the idea that they were driving the druids out is, is probably the more significant uh, uh, interpretation of this freeze. Okay. Scott, did you have a comment? I was just going to say, I think, I think of that crook as being a Christian symbol. It, it, it oh. applied here. It's Christian. It's, it's what the Pope carries. It's, it's, he's the shepherd of the people. I think it's the, the new religion. Yeah, it is. Uh, interestingly, you know, Mithras also had a crook. Or, that is to say, he, the metaphor of the sheep was also very much with Mithras, who, of course, predated the Christ. So there's a little borrowing going on. Or, and I much prefer this interpretation, there, there was a synchronicity of time and energy of between those two forms, right? In other words, it was appropriate to both, uh, both spiritual disciplines uh, that the idea of the crook and the sheep was, you know, a metaphoric reality. And, and do we know when, when this particular relief was carved? Do we know how old it is? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, that would, I, might, might help yeah, too. It would, us, it would tell us a lot. Yeah, I think it's late. I don't get a sense here of, of I, I'm getting a sense of it being later. Uh, something about, especially about the, the, um, what's the word, the, uh, the gesture of Venus and Mercury seemed to me quite late. Um, I don't know. And the heaviness of the form, there's this, it's sort of, you know, just the musculature and whatnot is certainly not classical. No, I don't think so either. No, it's, I, I think it's more modern, which, uh, well, may, may make the crook more a Christian symbol than that's that case. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think ultimately it is. You know, I mean, nobody, nobody is, um, uh, you know, um, quoting Mithras anymore, you know, unless this was from the Mithraic mysteries itself, and I don't think it is, then it's not Mithraic. Okay, any, anything else on that? Uh, Martha says, thinking of the staff as a symbol of his authority. Power yeah. by authority transcends brute power. Yeah, you know, that's also, you have to look at the difference in, in um, the usage of the word authority, don't you? You know, there's innate authority, authority through the fact of your, um, your consciousness, you know, that... And then there's um, authority given by, you know, um, society. It's very different, you know. And I think obviously, you know, the fact that those snakes are moving along as a result of him pointing his figure suggests the former. Um, okay, anyone else? That's all we've got for right now. Okay, I'd like to move along. I think I may be dreaming to think we're going to finish the the Celts this time but we're close to the end here um we did that and we are to reading this now isn't that correct 
we haven't read this yet. I think so. Carrie, can you read that for us, please? Okay. Describing the temples of the Druids, Charles Heckethorn in the Secret Societies of All Ages and Countries says, their temples wherein the sacred fire was preserved were generally situated on eminences and in dense groves of oak and assumed various forms, circular, because a circle was the emblem of the universe, oval in allusion to the mundane egg, from which issued, according to the traditions of many nations, the universe, or according to others, our first parents. Serpentine, because a serpent was the symbol of who, the Druidic Osiris, cruciform, because a cross is an emblem of regeneration, or wind to represent the motion of the divine spirit. Their chief deities were reducible to two, a male and a female, the great father and mother, who and Keridwin, distinguished by the same characteristics as belong to Osiris and Isis, Bacchus and Ceres or any other supreme god and goddess representing the two principles of all being. Yeah, that's a power-packed paragraph here. Uh, do we have any thoughts or questions on this? Okay, there are different schools of thought on the question of Druid temples. Many historians, including Godfrey Higgins and Albert Pike, believe that Stonehenge and other monolithic temples were Druidic in origin, but there is no direct evidence of this. Theosophy teaches that monolithic stone temples were built by a race of giants of a much greater antiquity than the Druids. Now, it's certainly possible that the Druids used these monolithic temples without themselves having been the architects. What we do know from Posidonius is that the Druids venerated oak groves and considered these groves to be temp in themselves temples without any structure, just the groves, um, and were tended to uh, as though they were temples. So could we get a reader for, for this, please? Martha, can you read that for us, please? From an examination of the Teutonic words for temple, Grimm has made it probable that amongst the Germans, the oldest sanctuaries were natural woods. However this may be, tree worship is well attested for all the great European families of the Aryan stock. Amongst the Celts, the oak worship of the Druids is familiar to everyone. Sacred groves were common among the ancient Germans and tree worship is hardly extinct amongst their descendants at the present day. At Uppsala, the old religious capital of Sweden, there was a sacred grove in which every tree was regarded as divine, the golden bough. Strabo says that the poets called temples by the name of groves, which Dr. Stuckley says was often done in scripture. These groves were kept by priests who dwelt there for that purpose. It is evident from Tacitus that the temples of the Druids in Angsley were in oaken groves. Bromham in Yorkshire was an immense forest of oak, Celtic Druids, 229. Thank you, Martha. Of course, the temples pictured here are relatively modern, but they were built to commemorate the ancient Druid presence in Brahman. Any thoughts or questions about this idea of oak groves? We'll take a look at who, and uh, it's interesting, um, Carrie pronounces Caridwin. Um, I've been pronouncing it Saridwin. I, I haven't looked it up to see if that's a hard scene or not. Carrie, do you have some authority around that Caridwin pronunciation? Good. Yes, uh, I'm Welsh, and it, uh, most of these uh -huh. names are, are Welsh. Okay. So it is Caridwen. It is Caridwen. Oh, that's that's really good to know. I kind of got that. 
confident in your pronunciation that you you knew <laughs> of what you were talking about there. So yeah, who is it? Who do you know that? Uh, that's not Welsh. I don't know what that is. Yeah, no. okay. but Caridwin is that correct? Caridwin, Caridwin, Caridwin. So you, you if, it, if it was Welsh, it would be Caridwin. Okay, Caridwin. I'm sure it is Caridwin. Okay. So we'll look at, at who and Karidwin after the next paragraphs of the text, which focuses on that. So let's get a reader for this. Can we get a reader, please? My mic's still open. I can read it. Yeah, that's, please yes, do. please. Godfrey Higgins states that who, the mighty, regarded as the first settler of Britain, came from a place which the Welsh triads called the summer country, the present site of Constantinople. Albert Pike says that the, the lost word of masonry is concealed in the name of the Druid god Hu. The meager information extant concerning the secret initiations of the Druids indicates a decided similarity between their mystery school and the schools of Greece and Egypt who, the sun god, was murdered and, after a number of strange ordeals and mystical, mystic rituals, was restored to life. Thank you, Carrie. Any thoughts or questions about this? So the cutting into the murdering, right? Or in Egypt, it's the cutting into many pieces of any solar god represents the disfiguring separative effect of sequential time and space or material existence. Reassembling a solar god is a metaphor for the return journey. As the Gayatri says, from darkness to light, from the unreal to the real, from death to immortality. Albert Pike links the solar who with the divine serpent. Can we get a reader for this, please? Um, the British god Hu was called the dragon ruler of the world, and his car was drawn by serpents. His ministries were styled adders. His ministers, sorry, were styled adders. A druid in a poem of Taliesin says, I am a druid. I am an architect. I am a prophet. I am a serpent. A naughty. The car of the goddess Caridwen also was drawn by serpents. In the elegy of uh, Uther Pendragon, this passage occurs in a description of the religious rites of the Druids. While the sanctuary is earnestly invoking the gliding king before whom the fair one retreats, upon the evil that covers the huge stones, whilst the dragon moves round over the places. You dropped out, Beale. I know, I can't speak anymore, which contained vessels of drink. I can't read, I'm sorry. Let me finish for you. So the gliding king, before whom the fair one retreats upon the evil, covered the huge stones, whilst the dragon moves round over the places which contain vessels of drink offering, whilst the drink offering is in the golden horns. It's an extraordinarily esoteric um, quote. You know, uh, you can do worse than just to read Morals and Dogma. Albert Pike was an extraordinary uh, person. Um, much more than just an author. Um, that's one of the reasons I've, I've quoted him so often. I, he has a, an, 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 eight, an innate authority. But I love this illustration. Um, it's a car driven by serpents with his ministers were styled adders. Let's get back to what Michael said, right? Serpents are uh, inherently... Uh, bearers of wisdom, right? Remember the Gundestrup cauldron where the the uh, the uh, shaman 
at least that's how I see it, was holding that serpent by the neck and had him up to its ear to listen to what it had to say, right? I love that. Here, it's, it's like being guided by serpent wisdom. Um, okay, any thoughts or questions about this? Okay, you know, we're so close here. I know we're over. We are so close to the end. Uh, that I would really like to push on. If, if we can go for another five minutes, we'll make it. Um, and okay. we come to. I, I just want to say, Lynn says, who is an important, um, I think, in the Mayan tradition? Who is an important? Who is important? Who? Who? Don't start on who's on first. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn, for that. Okay, that's interesting. And of course, serpent power was, you know, in, in middle America was, was also huge. I mean, you could pull up image after image of the serpent, serpent po poetry and, and uh, potency uh, in uh, uh, Central America, in the Mayans. Okay. Um, Rudolf Steiner is um, described the esoteric connotations of who and Keridwin during a lecture given in Berlin in 1909, which he entitled The European Mysteries and Their Initiates. Whether historically accurate or not, I think you'll find his analysis deeply insightful. Can we get a reader for this? Carrie, I've got to ask you to read that. You're, oops. You're self-muted. There you okay. go. Thank you. All that lies hidden be behind the sense world, as the sun behind the clouds, the hidden spirit, was known in these mysteries by the name of Who. Keridwin was the seeker so seeking soul, and all the rites of initiation were a means of revealing to the pupil that death is only one of the many processes in life. Death changes nothing at all in the innermost kernel of man's being. In the Druidic mysteries, Druid denotes an initiate of the third degree. The neophyte was put into a condition resembling death. His senses could not function as organs of perception. A man whose only instrument of perception is the physical body or the physical brain has no consciousness in a condition where his senses cease to function. But in initiation, the senses, feeling, hearing, and so on, cease to function. And yet the neophyte is able to experience and observe. The principle which observes was called Keridwin, the soul. And that which comes to meet the soul, as light and sound come to our outer eyes and ears, was called Who, the spiritual world. The initiate experienced the unions between Keridwin and Hu. Such experiences are described in the myths. When we are told today that the ancients paid homage to a god Hu and a goddess Keridwin, this is simply another way of describing initiation. The true myths are always concerned with initiation. It is empty chatter to say that these myths have an astronomical meaning that Keridwin is the moon and who the sun and so on. These myths originated because their creators were conscious of an inner union between the aspiring soul and the spirit of the sun, not the physical sun. The mysteries of who and Keridwin then were those into which men were initiated in the regions of which we are speaking. Thank you, Kerry. I find this line to be particularly provocative the principle which observes was called Keridun, the soul, and that which comes to meet the soul as light and sound come to our outer eyes and ears was called who? Francis. Sir, sir? Yeah. Okay. Christine uh, writes, and, and it's a comparison, Nadi snake, who? Black Earth, Egypt Human, H-U, Egypt Human, H-U-M-A-N, Human. Oh, 
interesting. Yeah. That's a really, I, I love that. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, let's see here. Um, it's in, this is a, an important point. Keridwen was the principle that observes after the outer senses are suspended. So clearly this observation is not, you know, the sense of sight as an outer sense. It's this, as a result of the outer senses being suspended, then Keridwen comes forth as, um, as, as what does he say? That which seeks, right? The seeking soul, right? That's the, the soul within the self. Um, and it's only after those, those outer senses are uh, suspended that the principle of observation can come forth. Very esoteric stuff, right? Any thoughts or questions about this? I was very pleased to have run across this. Okay, can we get a reader for, I know it's late guys, I'm sorry. Can we get a reader for this last paragraph on the Druids? Martha, can you read that please? There were few, there were three degrees of the Druidic mysteries but few successfully passed them all. The candidate was buried in a coffin as symbolic of the death of the sun god. The supreme test, however, was being sent out to sea in an open boat. While undergoing this ordeal, many lost their lives. Taliesin, an ancient scholar who passed through the mysteries, describes the initiation of the open boat in Faber's pagan idolatry. The few who passed this third degree were said to have been born again and were instructed in the secret and hidden truths which the Druid priests had preserved from antiquity. From these initiates were chosen many of the dignitaries of the British religious and political world. For further details, see Faber's Pagan Idolatry, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, and Godfrey Higgins' Celtic Druids. Thank you, Martha. Okay, I what I want to do is skip this part. We'll do it next time, um, and finish up with um, uh, the Albert Pike's description of the Druidic initiations, which has direct relevance to the paragraph that we just um, that we just read. So, if we could get a reader for this. Karen. The main features of the Druidical mysteries resembled those of the Orient. The ceremonies commenced with a hymn to the sun. The candidates were arranged in ranks of threes, fives, and sevens according to their qualifications and conducted nine times around the sanctuary from east to west. The candidate underwent many trials one of which had direct reference to the legend of Osiris. He was placed in a boat and sent out to sea alone, having to rely on his own skill and presence of mind to reach the opposite shore in safety. The death of Hu was represented in his hearing with every external mark of sorrow while he was in utter darkness. He met with many obstacles, had to prove his courage and expose his life against armed enemies represented by various animals. And at last attaining the permanent light, he was instructed by the arch druid in regard to the mysteries and in the morality of the order incited to act bravely in war, taught the great truths of the immortality of the soul and a future state solemnly enjoined not to neglect the worship of the deity, nor the practice of rigid morality, and to avoid sloth, contention, and folly. The aspirant attained only the exoteric knowledge in the first two degrees. 
The third was attained only by a few, and they persons of rank and consequence. And after long purification and study, all of the arts and sciences known to the Druids in solitude for nine months. This was the symbolical death and burial of these mysteries. The dangerous voyage upon the actual open sea in a small boat covered with a skin on the evening of the 29th of April was the last trial and closing scene of initiation. If he declined this trial, he was dismissed with contempt. If he made it and succeeded, he was termed thrice born, was eligible to all the dignities of the state and received complete instruction in the philosophical and religious doctrines of the Druids. Thank you, Karen. So the term thrice born suggests a further initiation from the more usual twice born akin to becoming a master mason, like the third degree, but in a far more rigorous discipline. Um, so any final thoughts or questions on the Druids? We have a, a comment from Ann Veronica. Um, it's the formula, black, sun, antikarana. Okay. Thank I think you. I think that's in relation to what Christine said: the Nadis, the snake, and who the Black Earth and the Egyptian. Oh, I see. Interesting. And okay. Scott, Scott has his hand up. Yeah. Um, my only thought was that this is um, seems being uh, sent out on the boat seems to be quite literal, and yet I can't imagine it's not also just astral and dealing with it on that level those are the, the real tests um where it's got to be happening it's symbolic and yet it's seemed to have been actual given the, the time and the people yeah but the whole boat thing and, and, and on the sea is um come on <laughs> yeah exactly. well you remember from previous webinars you know these are space so far apart that it's it's hard to get uh, a complete continuum, but we've looked at this idea that um, uh, Merlin, for instance, went on a, went on a voyage on the boat to the uh, to a mystical land, right? And so you have this reference in connection with the Druids all over the place. Uh, the glass boat is brought up, for instance. Sure. Like, yeah, well, you know, glass boats, first rock, you're down, you know we're talking here on a metaphoric level and yet i agree with you i think this literally took place and that there is a a, a teeming between the physical event and the and that voyage across the uh, astral waters um that was probably part of the the mysteries of the druids you know i mean it's really that which for the Osphus, uh, especially DK Theosophists, it's, it's that which must be accomplished in order to take the second initiation, right? Um, you, you must reconcile the pairs of opposites, uh, and that includes both astral and lower mental, in order to uh, take this second and third progressive initiation, initiations. So, you know, interestingly, thrice born might suggest a third initiate, you know, which would be, if this was the real deal, you know, if these juridical mysteries were the real deal, I could, you know, you know, the fact that very few accomplish this, um, it's at least a possibility. Of course, all things druid are hypothetical. That's, you know, I want to really emphasize that. Um, you know, the next we're getting into the rites of Mithras next. There's so much more extant uh, information. Um, their, their scriptures are still survived, et cetera. Right? It's Zoroastrianism. But with the Druids, we don't have much. You know, so there's, you know, but then there's this, this idea that Steiner and Albert Pike, I trust their intuitions, you know, so, um, I, I wouldn't dismiss it out of hand. 
there's enough information to show that there was a powerful mystery school that happened in that time among the Celts. So with that, we're going to pull the plug. I'm sorry to keep you so late, but I, I really did want we to finish this. We actually have another hand and we have some comments too. So lots of comments. Um, I'm, I'm fine with staying here. Um, I will say that, you know, we're, let's, let's do this. Um, I wanted to ask you, Biel, before this started, uh, is there any other date in April that we can slot this in? No. I know that the no. Sundays are the Sundays are gone. The Sundays right? the Sundays are gone because we got the full moon on a weekend, and we have Easter. So it's oh. and then okay. all the other webinars that we've got. There's just no way we can fit no something in. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so what this means, folks, is that we won't meet again until not May, but June, because the first Sunday in May, I'll be at the conference. Uh, and I actually even considered, you know, sitting in my hotel room and, and giving this. But I think a whole lot of you will be at the conference with me. Um, and I just can't predict my time there well enough to you know, to for sure be able to say that I could do that. So that means a two month vacation. So don't forget about the secret teachings of all ages over the next two months. Join us again in the first Sunday of June, uh, which seems such a far long way off, three months really. Yeah, so, but um, we, we are good to go with the secret doctrine on the 15th of March and the 19th of April. So, so uh, hang in there. We'll, and, we'll uh, be doing other stuff. Um, we have other webinars going on too. So anyway, yeah. Okay. So now for those of you who, you know, have had enough at a quarter after the hour, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to pull the plug, but I'm one to uh, address those of you who have comments, thoughts, okay. Uh, Christine has her hand up. Christine, I've unmuted you, but you are self-muted. There you go. Uh, you're, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Christine. Yeah, it doesn't look like that's working. Okay, well, there were, there were some more uh, questions. Um, Jonathan says serpents are the driving force behind that which the druid drives. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was a culture of of wisdom and the ser serpent was revered. Uh, yeah. But the serpent again means knowledge, so um, always. So it's yeah. meta we're metaphorical. Not talking, we're, all talking about, we're not talking about physical serpents here, folks. You know, um, and that's universal. You know, Moses had a serpent on a dowel that, you know, he held up and, 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 well, that again is also the mysteries. You know, it's it's always that. Yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah. Uh, Anne Veronica says, the boat and the river Styx. Hercules went to the underworld in the realm of Pluto. Yeah, it's another you know, using the boat as a protective vehicle for uh, the trials that you had to pass through, right? It's like your your armor in a sense, uh, or a conveyance from one reality, your everyday reality, to something, so to a reality that is going to where your tests will take place, right? But also in this case, it suggests that the the passage itself uh, is the test, right? The the fact of the ability to navigate the open waters, and the and that is a metaphor for your own astral um, uh, consciousness is the test. Anyone else? Anything else? Um, and Jonathan adds the caduceus. Uh, you know, he was talking about the serpents and the driving force behind the druids. And uh, 
Okay. Okay. Christine says. Uh, I don't understand this. Reference the uh, quarters regarding a pole shift. Two, three, five, one, eight, nineteen, eleven, one. Uh, are those dates, Christine? Or I'm sorry, I don't understand what she's typing uh, there. You know, I don't, I don't either. I'm sure there's significance there, but uh, I'm not picking it up. I probably have to study that series of numbers to see if there's what she's getting at there. Anything else? Uh, she says, uh, our solstice and equinoxes. Um, I, I think they were dates. Oh, okay. Oh, well, there is something about that. Yeah. So it would be um, the 3rd of February, the 1st of May, the 19th of August, the 1st of November. Right. Yeah. Um, one thing I can say about that is that um, through the progression of the equinoxes, they've discovered that um, the, the equinox uh, uh, occurred on May 1st, something like 4,000 plus years ago. So, you know, if you, if you accept the idea that May Day, um, and, it, you know, which is, of course, much more profound in Druidic culture than our concept of May Day, um, but still use the poles, uh, the, the, that pole, which to me suggests um, the equinox. Uh, anyway, that, that these uh, uh, rituals um, and the initiations that took place on these dates date from that far off time, from, you know, 4,000, uh, because even by the time of the Druids, those dates had shifted um, off of of uh, those dates. So I, I can't say that about them. Anything else? Uh, that's all I see right now. So okay. let's say well, thank you, everybody, okay. and goodbye. Yeah. And hope so to see you 15 March. And our time changes next weekend. So on 15 March, We'll be doing this at 7 p.m. GMT. Which, which means that unless, unless you're in a time zone that doesn't go to daylight savings time, uh, like for instance, Arizona in the US, and I think there are others around the world, uh, unless you're in that time zone, it will be at the same local time as it is now because we're changing the GMT time. If you are in one of those time zones, you, you know, you ought to just. Uh, for that. Well, so. I, I think that's technically true for those of us in the U.S., but I don't believe the European time changes um, that quickly. I think they, they're they an oh, okay. a weird. Europe changes, Europe changes March 29th. Okay. okay, good point. So there's two factors if you live in a, right. you know, if it takes and place after the There's three. If you live in Australia, it's totally different, but yeah, I think it's time to pull the plug, folks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and I look forward to picking this up in in June and uh, this particular stream. And we'll see you all, hopefully, on March 15th. Is that correct? That's correct. The 15th. 15th. The 15th. For the next uh, uh, Secret Doctrine webinar. Okay. All right. Thank Bye you. Bye, everybody.